Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. So I don't normally like to cover non-avian dinosaurs. Firstly, as I like to specialise on more obscure extinct animals. And secondly, the so-called terrible lizards get plenty of really good coverage elsewhere on the platform. However, I'm still just as fascinated by Mesozoic dinosaurs as many other paleo enthusiasts are. So I thought I may as well cover the more poorly known early history of their lineages from time to time. In this case, I'll be detailing the rise of the first sauropodomorphs, the famous group of long-necked herbivores that reached gargantuan sizes during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. However, like all dinosaurs, they started off somewhat small and marginal animals in a Triassic world full of a staggering diversity of odd archosauromorphs. Exactly when true dinosaurs first evolved is uncertain, with the oldest confirmed remains dating to about 233 million years ago, during the Carnian stage of the late Triassic, fragmentary remains of the mysterious genus Nyasasaurus may push back the origin of dinosaurs to around 243 million years ago, although this is very debatable. At a very early stage in their evolution, these animals split into three major groups from basal carnivorous ancestors. These were the theropods, the ornithischians, and the sauropodomorphs. While the origins of the ornithischians is still very controversial, seeing as they have an almost non-existent Triassic fossil record, aside from the strange possible Silesaurid Pisanosaurus, the other two lineages, often placed together in Saurischia, had already diversified rapidly. Indeed, despite how incredibly different the late Cretaceous descendants of these early forms would become, if we were to travel back in time to the Carnian and Norian, then it would be incredibly difficult to tell the first theropods and sauropodomorphs apart. Both were generally small, slender bipeds, with carnivorous or omnivorous tendencies, with paleontologists initially struggling to place some early species. This was the case with the diminutive Eoraptor, once thought to be a very basal theropod. Measuring about 1.5 meters or about 5 feet long, and native to the Ishigualasto formation of Argentina, this small genus would have been agile and fast running with a graceful build. Its teeth were heterodont, which is quite rare among dinosaurs, with serrated recurved teeth in the upper jaw, like the teeth of theropods, and leaf shaped teeth in the lower jaw, like the teeth of basal sauropodomorphs. In life, it was probably an omnivore albeit one biased towards feeding on insects, lepidosaurs, and small mammal-like cynodonts. Long considered a basal theropod, more recent studies have consistently found Eoraptor to be a very basal sauropodomorph, with its varied teeth hinting at a shift towards a diet including some amount of plant matter. It was the description of a related genus, Buriolestes, in 2016, that helped to solidify this position. One of the oldest of all known dinosaurs, this genus was present in what is now Brazil about 233 million years ago. It would have looked very much like Eoraptor, apart from its slightly shorter overall length and narrower, more elongated jaws. It was also a more solely carnivorous animal, with sharp serrated teeth suitable for hunting small prey. Despite resembling a small theropod, Buriolestes possessed several typical sauropodomorph features, such as a downturned jaw tip, and the long deltopectoral crest on the humerus. It also lacked a proportionally small skull and wide nasal openings, with the paper describing the genus placing it as the most basal sauropodomorph so far known. Interestingly, while the later sauropods are famous for their pneumatized skeletons, early relatives like Buriolestes lacked this feature, suggesting that a complex system of air sacs within the bones evolved independently in pterosaurs, theropods, and more derived sauropodomorphs. Like Eoraptor, many of the best-known early long-necked relatives have been found at the Argentinian Ishigualasto formation. These include the genus Panphagia, whose name means all-eater, referencing its omnivorous diet. A small animal measuring about 1.3 meters long, the teeth of this small dinosaur show a transition between those of a carnivore and those of later sauropods. A slightly more derived family, also from South America, were the Saturnaliids, named after the type genus Saturnalia itself. Although generally resembling the more basal forms mentioned earlier, and still possessing a largely carnivorous diet, Saturnalia had already developed some feature typical of later sauropods, such as a proportionally longer neck, and small skull in relation to the overall size of the animal. It would have been a fast-running generalist, 
which enabled it to escape from contemporary predators such as Storekosaurus. The closely related Chromogisaurus would have been a similar animal, albeit slightly longer at about 2 metres. Moving away from South America and into the later Triassic, we come to the very first of these basal sauropod relative to be scientifically described. This was the genus Thecodontosaurus, found in the UK and named all the way back in 1843, making it one of the first dinosaurs to be recognised as such. Known from very complete remains, this animal measured about 2 metres long, with a relatively large head, prominent eye sockets and a comparatively short neck. Its teeth were small, leaf-shaped and serrated, indicating a fully herbivorous diet, while the forelimbs were quite strongly muscled, being adapted for grasping vegetation. It lived in a hot, insular environment between 203 and 201 million years ago, being well adapted for fast bipedal running, although it's possible that it could stand with its forelimbs touching the ground. The closely related animal, Pantidraco, was native to what is now Wales at about the same time, and would have been quite similar to Thecodontosaurus, although it is a more poorly known genus. One of the first larger sauropodomorphs, and definitely the most famous, was also native to Europe, in this case between about 227 and 204 million years ago. This was Platyosaurus, a very well studied genus that inhabited what is now Germany, Switzerland and France. It was massive in comparison to the animals we've covered so far, with the species P. trossingensis measuring in the region of 4.8 to 10 metres in length and weighed up to 4 metric tonnes. However, the upper limits of this range probably represent very large individuals, not being typical of the population as a whole. The geologically older species, P. gracilis, was somewhat smaller, with a total length of 4 to 5 metres. A largely herbivorous animal, equipped with a stocky body, a small boxy skull, and short but well-muscled forelimbs, Patiosaurus was an obligate biped built for fast running. This is in contrast to older depictions of the animal, most famously in Walking with Dinosaurs, which show the genus as a flexible quadruped, able to stand on its hind legs but spending most of its time on all fours. However, more recent studies have shown that the forelimbs could not be pronated, with Platyosaurus also having a centre of gravity placed directly over the hips. Analysis of its bone histology have revealed the animal to have been endothermic and active, with fully grown individuals having a wide range of sizes, which is unusual for non-avian dinosaurs, which generally grew to a fairly fixed maximum upper limit. Beyond Platyosaurus and its more poorly understood relatives, all more derived sauropodomorphs were members of the clade Massapoda, which rather unflatteringly means the lump feet. Early members of this group include animals like Riochosaurus, which was quite similar to Platyosaurus in overall appearance, and measured between 6.6 .6 and 10 metres long. Native to Argentina between 223 and 213 million years ago, this was another early sauropod relative that was often depicted as being a quadruped, when more recent research has shown that it was poorly adapted for doing this. A close relative, Cerasaurus, persisted into the early Jurassic in the southwest of the United States. A smaller, more slenderly built genus of up to 4 metres, or 13 feet long, and about 440 pounds in mass, it would have been a browsing herbivore, pulling vegetation towards its small head with powerful gripping forelimbs. It lived in the semi-arid Kyenta formation, and would have been one of the main prey items for the formidable Dilophosaurus, one of the first large theropods. Just outside of the more derived clade sauropodiforms, which contains the true sauropods and their close relatives, lies the successful family Massospondylidae. This group possessed a near-global range, spanning from the late Triassic to the early Jurassic, although exactly which species are included varies from study to study. The type genus, Massospondylus, is of course the centre of the family. Native to southern Africa during the early Jurassic, it measured about 4 metres long and walked bipedally. However, I do remember seeing a mounted specimen of this animal at the Natural History Museum in London that was positioned as a quadruped, which was clearly a trend in the past when depicting early sauropod relatives. With a proportionally tiny head, long neck and short but strong forelimbs equipped with large hooked thumb claws, which massospondus probably used for foraging and self-defence, this was one of the goofiest looking sauropodomorphs. 
analysis of unhatched fossilised embryos associated with this genus have been taken to suggest that the young may have been quadrupedal and shifted to bipedalism as they grew. However, this conclusion has been challenged by more recent studies. Related animals include the well-known Chinese genus Lufongosaurus, which was quite large at up to 9 metres long and 2.3 tonnes in weight, as well as the much more fragmentary Glacialosaurus from the early Jurassic of Antarctica. This wide distribution suggests that sauropodomorphs had achieved a global range before the end of the Triassic, being among the most successful of the early dinosaurs, while the more derived sauropodiforms would begin the shift to even larger body sizes and fully quadrupedal postures. The animals covered in this episode were very diverse, ranging from early small carnivores to the large high browsing Platyosaurus, which filled a niche similar to that of the later Therizinosaurs that diversified during the Cretaceous. Although the first quadrupedal sauropod relatives had already emerged by the late Triassic, these would truly go on to great success as the Jurassic progressed, with the bipedal forms declining before dying out by around the middle of the period although that is a story best left for another time. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the Matsoids, a somewhat controversial grouping of archaic snakes that persisted into the Pleistocene. See you again soon. Cheerio.